the first event for today is the talk on the topic AI and its role in furthering applications on cloud. We are honored to invite the chairperson for this talk, Dr. Lipika De, who is a chief scientist at TCS Research and Innovation. She also heads analytics and insight practices. Dr. De holds a PhD in computer science and engineering from IIT Kharagpur. Her research interests are in the areas of NLP, text and data mining, machine learning, and semantic search. We will try now call uh, call upon Dr. Lipika De to introduce and invite the keynote speaker for the talk. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Gargi B. Das Gupta, who is the director for IBM Research in India and the CTO for IBM India South Asia. In her role as director, Gargi is responsible for establishing and executing the technical agenda of IBM India's research lab in collaboration with IBM's worldwide research labs and business units. In her role as CTO, Gargi is responsible for representing and communicating IBM's overall technical vision and strategy. Gargi is a champion of women in STEM and has received several recognitions from Fortune India, Business Today, India AI, uh, to name a few, for her unique role at the intersection of technology and business. In 2022, she was recognized by the ACM, uh, with the ACM India OCCW Award. She is an alumnus of Jadavpur University and University of Maryland. It's a pleasure to have Gargi with us today as the inaugural keynote speaker of ACM Women Workshop, the first event of the annual ACM India Convention of 2022. I now request Dr. Gargi Dasgupta to please share her thoughts with us. Over to you, Gargi. Thank you. Thank you, Lipika, for the wonderful introduction. And hello, good afternoon, everyone. My absolute pleasure to be at this workshop. And I've been this, I've been at ACMW events uh, from very uh, almost from almost 10 years back. My association with uh, Hina Chitra goes back a long way. So really a pleasure. Let me quickly start. Um, see if I can share my screen. Um, Just give me a thumbs up and you can see. Can yes, ma'am, we're uh, able to see. see. Okay, yeah. very good. Okay, so I've, I've kind of uh, kept this talk as a mix of where from my perspective, I see trends going in the world of computing. Uh, the role of AI, which is I think close to so many of our hearts. Uh, the role of cloud, which is a very important trendsetter. And then I'll also talk about some key uh, technical topics that gives you a flavor of the, of the breadth and the depth of the problems that as a student community one could look to solve. So some, some key trends, right? And I know you guys face it every day as you work, um, either as a data scientist, as a machine learning engineer, as a systems enthusiast. And the two trends are cloud, and code, right? How many of you started off with your first machine learning project using uh, the Google Colab framework? How many of you log into your university's um, you know, clusters, be it um, high computing frameworks with GPUs? Maybe a few have privileged access to TPUs, but, but that's, that's how we do our work and, and that's become a norm. So the so predictions that we make around these first, that is everyone around us. And when I say company, you know, it could be a small uh, Kirana shop. It could be a medium business. Um, and of course, it could be large enterprises, but everyone will need cloud and will need AI. So every company will be cloud and AI. All workloads will become distributed, which means that when you, when you log into your Colab uh, Jupyter notebook, oftentimes you have no clue where that particular virtual machine or server is 
allocated or provisioned. And it could be anywhere. It could be in Bangalore, it could be in Delhi, it could be in China, it could be all halfway around the world in Europe or in the US. But distributed workloads are becoming a reality and we'll see more and more of those. And we as users may not, may not really feel it, but technologies to provide the distributed systems, distributed computing framework, uh, know that this is a reality, right? I don't know if you guys are familiar with the uh, distributed machine learning frameworks like Ray. If you've not, you should look it up, but that's, that's becoming a norm. Now, as part of running this high-end intelligent, you know, uh, representation-based algorithms that we love to call AI, there's a whole lot of work around data preparation. And data becomes a number one commodity in this game. And data preparation often takes 80% of the data scientist's time, right? And, and these are things that we've seen over and over again, which means that these are all areas that we need to improve on and keep our eyes on. Multi-cloud platforms unlock 2.5 times. I'll, and I'll show you with an example, what is a multi-cloud platform? The, the, second, the second column really shows, apart from the usual data sources that we try to think of, which is speech data, text data, image data, time series data, data structured data sitting in tables. There's a very, very important data that is created with this move to cloud, with this move to distributed systems, with this proliferation of applications. And that's code. There's hundreds and millions of lines of code created every day. And our prediction is that AI will need to really need to work on code. And that's why I, this talk is going to be based on, most of it is going to be based on how AI can further application development, maintenance and management itself. The other, um, the other trend that all of you should keep your eyes on is 20 years back, you know, open source was looked upon as a menace, right? It had vulnerabilities, it has security troubles, no one would sign up. Today, 96% of our enterprise code bases actually contain open source code. There, yes, there are challenges, there are vulnerabilities, there is this huge issue that happened with Log4j library, but but it's still reality that this is how the future is going to be. So something for you guys to keep in mind. So with these as trends, interesting facts. This, this graph only goes till 2020. The x-axis is the years, the y-axis is the petaflops per day that is spent on training. And look at where Moore's law had predicted and look at where we are today. Today, every 18 months, the compute requirements go 35x, right? And you can see as we made the journey from Alex nets to convolutional neural nets, rest nets, all the way AlphaGo, GPT, and now the world is of foundation models. So huge, huge ask on compute. And now you'll be able to relate back to why the trends, why is one cloud not enough? Why is multi-cloud going to unlock? Why specialized clouds are needed? Data, so that's, that was a compute chart, data. Data is growing at a phenomenal rate. By 2025, we expect the data produced to be 175 zettabytes. Right, and in 2018, we only had about few 30 odd. So what is, how big is that? You know, it's, it's a number, it has so many zeros after it. So how big is that? To, to if we had to store, let's say those 175 zet zettabytes on Blu-ray uh, disks, the number of Blu-ray disks that one would need would be as long as from here to the moon 23 times. That's the amount of data that's getting created, right? And, and if, you, if you think back that 
you know, there's data about interaction, there's data about what I say, there's image, speech, video data I'm creating now and you're creating now as we join uh, the Zoom link. And there is this data for code, right? Applications are getting created left, right, and center. You know, my my uh, 12, 12 year old son wants to create applications that looks at an image and says whether it's funny or um, not, not funny. So everyone's creating applications. But there's some trends in this whole application creation landscape, and that's also important to keep in mind. One is about 10 years ago, a team would create an application. The team, just five people, 10 people, 20 people, would try to keep the application centrally managed so that when there is a problem on the application, they all know the lines of code and then they can debug it. That's what we call monolith applications. Monolith applications have grown and, and today you can have almost you know, tens of millions of lines as big as that, a monolith application. But the programming paradigm has changed. Right, as you go into cloud, the whole value of cloud is of course paper use, but scale as you go as well. Which means if I have a compute intensive part, right, that's taking just a lot of CPUs, I could scale it up vertically, irrespective of the other data processing and storage or network parts. If I have a network intensive part, I could scale that piece up individually, put more VMs to it put more cores behind it and not, not worry about the entire application. Now, when you have a monolith, there's no way you can do that. There's no way you can really take advantage of cloud. And hence the cloud native paradigms of computing, which is microservices, 12 factor ready, all of these have come up. And the whole microservices architecture, what it really allows you to do is take a very, very long and complex piece of code, but break it up into functionalities, expose them to APIs, and then your whole application becomes a workflow of APIs calling APIs, taking some input, producing some output, sometimes they're stateful, so you need persistent storage, and, and then the whole application functionality is re realized. So today, no one writes those, you know, huge thousands and ten thousands or even million slides of code. People work in a team. They distribute their responsibilities and they develop microservices. So now, instead of managing one big joint, you have fifty components to manage. So yes, there's management complexity increases, but at the same time, you know, expertise is is needed on certain componentry of the code, and it makes it much easier. The other of computing localization, like I said, I mean, I think gone are the days of centralized computing and um, you know, big, big data centers where all the computing is done. Today I can do compute on my edge device, on my, on my um, iPad, right? So computing is getting decentralized and devices are of all form factors. So you really need nimbleness in being able to do some compute Unselected set of data on your edge devices, then move it back to the cloud, you know, train bigger models on the cloud, bring back inference at the edge. That's another trend on how computing is changing. And the other is homogeneous to heterogeneous, right? Now, every, every hardware vendor now can specialize in a certain things, right? Oracle specializes in their database offerings. Storage offerings specialized by EMC. Intel specializes in producing the most efficient CPUs. So heterogeneity has and specialization is another thing that we have to design for, and which is why it's very important to have a uniform substrate, at least for the developer community. All right, so the last thing on trends, and then we'll see where AI is going. Uh, remember I said multi-clouds unlock a lot of lot more value, 2.5 times I said. So what, what, what's an example? So we, we all, let's, let's take the top three cloud providers. So there's um, Azure by Microsoft, which really specializes in confidential compute. 
which means if you have PI, SPI, you can rest be sure that the functions there performed without unmasking or revealing the client information. And that's, that's their offering, confidential computing. Google, great. If you want to train your machine learning models on GPUs, we already talked about Collab and all the different functionalities they provide. And then let's say AWS uh, really specializes in uh, scalable inferencing. Now it's possible that you as a user logging in from your university have this huge pipeline where data processing, you need to process PI, SPI, and you need it to get the best cloud for confidential computing. You have to train your foundation model, which will take you know, three months and cost you maybe um, you know, $500,000. Uh, but but the Google Cloud option is the best, maybe in terms of performance and cost. And then you want to inference on AWS. What multi-cloud really, and it's 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 a at this point, let me say it's an aspirational goal. It's where I see the whole world of compute going. It's I I log in from my terminal and I should be able to launch a data processing job. Um, that feeds its output into training. The training job takes whatever time it takes. And then it says, I'm ready, ready for uh, creating a model that's deployed on AWS and ready to take requests for inferencing. That whole thing runs with one YAML file where I specify, this is the set of three things you do. And it runs on three different clouds in three different regions, halfway around the world. And I, I do not need to go and book my allocate servers on Azure or on AWS or on Google. So that's the serverless vision. And it's, it's, it's the holy grail, right? It's not, it's not true anywhere today. And it's something that we should all aspire for. Okay, I think that's enough for system enthusiasts. Let's see where the world is uh, of AI is going, okay? Um, is there in every, 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 every conversation that I've had on technology either started with AI or ended with AI, right? It's on everyone's mind. Um, last year, when I presented this chart, I said, well, you know, 30,000, we had 30,000 AI deployments with customers. This year, the number is 40,000. It's growing at a scale and pace that I have not seen any other technology grow at. Um, but but it's crucial to to make sure that people trust AI, right? And and there's this whole genre of trusted AI that I'm not going to get in. Um, is uh, the only lever and the only way we will make AI deployment successful. So how has AI grown, or how has it evolved, right? If you look back, um, 10, 15 years ago, we were at the narrow AI task where we. Think of the ResNet, CNN, convolutional neural networks, doing really, really well in lowering speech um, error rates and improving blue score on NLP tasks. Very good, very good, specific task. Image recognition, I can do it. Um, parsing, uh, semantic encoding, I can do it. Very good, very good. Speech to text, I can do it for certain languages where I have a lot of corpus. Very good narrow AI. Then it became more broader. As it became broader, that's where it, it now penetrates each and every business. And, and we've seen you know, it go from data sources of speech, text, and image to more semi-structured data. What is semi-structured? For example, logs, you know, logs applications generate or the things that you write are semi-structured. Time series data, very important, um, and, and code, and we'll talk about code. The second thing I already mentioned is that automation of the AI itself has become very important. 80% of time spent in data cleaning, data transformation. I think we need to have automated AI tasks there. Trust, very important. And this is where we are today, right? We are, we are creating bigger and bigger models on wider and wider data sources. And really what we want to get to is general intelligence, right? Artificial general intelligence, which means reasoning comes in, generative capability comes in. Who knows, you know, in 2050 and beyond, 
you know, if, if there is AI that has studied all Gargi stocks and all her papers, should be able to come and give a keynote speech at ACMW, right? That's, that's the artificial human general intelligence that we're striving for. But we're not there yet and a lot needs to be done. And today I'm going to talk about, I'm going to zoom in on two use cases on AI for code. And, and, and there are so many out there and so many other experts will tell you what to focus on. But if you're interested in code, then this is definitely a good use case. In 2011, uh, you know, Mark Anderson said software is eating the world and he had predicted that every company is going to become a software company and he was not wrong. I think this is still before Netflix. This is pre Netflix and he was not wrong. I mean, who would have thought a video rental company putting content online becomes the biggest software, one of the biggest software companies with great platform, great infrastructure, great middleware to render videos, great recommendation engine. I just love what Netflix recommends for me. 2016, I think uh, there was another article that says that you know, code is everywhere and software is still eating the world. And there's a lot of innovations to be done on the software itself. And this is the main difference. So when we say AI for code, of course, AI itself is a code and application, but we are saying, can you look at the, the huge amounts of the trillions and the millions of data that's being created every day as application developers write code and use AI to really simplify their journey, right? Why do we think it's possible. Well, we think it's possible because we've seen the story repeat for speech, you know, years and years of research. And finally, around 2017, the word error rates dropped so much in speed that it became indistinguishable from human word error rates. Language benchmarks, blue scores have been improving. And look at where we are with the transformer based world, right? Of course, we've gone through our whole, whole sequence to sequence LSTM journeys. And this is where we are. And today is the world of all representations and embeddings. So, so there are many, many similarities with code. Uh, code is polyglot, just like language. Um, code needs, code has parsing requirements similar to language. Um, the tokenization and the stemming will be dependent on the code language, but it still has parsing requirements. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very attractive for humans to be able to handle various code problems like summarization, search, everything else that we've seen in the NLP domain. So I'll give you one, one concrete example, right? Um, so just, just to go back, and, and this is work that got published in AAAI 21, so you're most welcome to go and look at the paper. But here is the context. Everything that I told you before, right? Remember I said cloud computing is here. It's here. It's moving at a pace. Every company is going to become a cloud company. And, and, and computing paradigms are changing, right? But people, the code that we wrote 10 years back or 20 years back or 40 years back doesn't go away. Right? Yes, I could start writing new cloud native, nicely formatted microservices today, but there is a big challenge of taking this huge monolith codes and maintaining them for the future. Now, one could throw up their hands and say, well, I'm going to throw away all that code and rewrite it. Well, guess what? That would mean most you know, of our health system, our hospitals would, would go down, the banks, our ATM withdrawals, our deposit systems would go down. And many, many critical care systems will have to be taken down and only come back once the new code is ready. So that's obviously not feasible. So what can be done, right? And today we have manual labor, right? As large as thousands and thousands of people really looking at this monolith codes, it could be Java, it could be sometimes it's COBOL, 
um, you know, sometimes it's C++, uh, very network efficient C++ codes written. And then trying to come up with a mechanism, a process where they can understand the business logic, uh, create metadata, and then break it up into microservices. Okay, and they do it manually, tirelessly going through those lines of code and creating the microservices. And it takes, for an automobile company, we knew it took them one and a half years to get from, for one application, monolith to its microservices. Okay? We don't have that kind of patience or time to really modernize and transform uh, the world. So this is the first AI, AI use case, I will say that take all those lines of code and can you come up with candidate microservices? Of course, it's, it's you know, the, the implementation will, will be dependent on the underlying language, but here is how AI can help. Again, I mean, read the paper, but this is, this is what it could do. I, I, I touched upon representation, so it's, it's going to be useful. So the first is we have several PLSE tools, right? We have programming language, software engineering tools that can actually go do static analysis of the code, go through line by line and figure out the call flow graph. What calls what, what parameters are passed, what are the entry points, what are the exit points, great. We could use them as the first set of features from applications. The second is maybe we could create a graph, right? Because you know, a program flow is very similar to nodes and the edges could represent the communication between classes. I'm going to, the example is for Java. So I'm going to use some Java terminology. Imagine a class calling out to a class and that we create an edge. So a little bit of animation. So, so and you could create a call flow graph pretty much like that. Let's assume the edges are unweighted. So, so on that graph, the task really is of clustering, right? And we could maybe throw a, a good clustering algorithms to come up with uh, what could be the components of the microservices. And why clustering would give you a okay enough result is because the edges are representing interclass communication. And whenever you create, have good clustering algorithms with great cohesiveness within the cluster and weak cohesiveness across the clusters, your job is done. But there is a problem. The problem is that many times when in the monoliths, when code was written, there could be structures that go against the spirit of microservices, which means there could be one class that's being called out from numerous other classes and if you put a reconstruction loss on a normal clustering algorithm, your, your result is going to be really uh, bad, right? So one way to do that, one way to counter that is to have the graph with the, with the vertices as the classes, the edges, like we said, it's, you know, if there's a call flow, but then now start defining node attributes so that we can use the loss function in a smarter way. So what are the node attributes? Remember I'm, I'm in the microservice world. So I should be defining entry points. Entry points are similar to API endpoints, right? Where the external world actually calls my function. So I define those entry points and for each of those entry points, I define a relationship between classes saying if that two classes are on the call flow of an entry point, I give them a weight. Um, Every class that appears on the call flow of an entry point, I give them an attribute. And then of course, this is a Java specific thing might not exist in other non-object oriented languages, which is, you know, I, if I and you have an inheritance relationship, I give that an attribute because it's really a programming language or uh, specific mm -hmm. artifact. So now, um, and, and this is what I was talking about is that why these outliers are very specific in, in the code task that I'm looking at, because I do want to minimize structural outliers. Structural outliers, you know, classes which have a lot of interaction, 
with all other classes, maybe a reporting class, right? It, everyone calls because all after they've done all their computations, they report. Similarly, an attribute class, which has similar behavior with other classes. I want to minimize these two in my clustering. So now if I reformulate my program, um, and, and here we use an encoder decoder to just say, not minimize only the reconstruction loss, but also minimize the structural outliers and the attribute outliers reconstruction loss. Then I have a better clustering algorithm, right? So again, look through the paper. I think it's, it's out there, a great paper, how to use, how to take lines of code, create an embedding um, of a graph neural net, but also get in program specific behavior or let's say microservice specific behavior that you want to model, fold it into the loss and then come up with a graph convolution network based uh, encoder. Let me just see how much time I have. Okay. Okay to go on for maybe 10 more minutes. Yeah, sure, Kanti. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so just just going back. So, I'm 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 trying to motivate folks that you know the world is going towards AI and hybrid cloud. There's a lot of AI use cases as we move from our legacy environments to new cloud native architectures. And I'm on the use case of application modernization because I, I know, you know, uh, that we are going to write new, when we start writing code today, we're going to write new microservices enabled, um, container Kubernetes ready, 12 factor ready app. But that's not the reality, right? So, so I'm, I'm also trying to motivate you to look at some of these problems that help transition, make the transition from old to new faster. So some personas, I mean, I, you know, who would love to see you guys solve this AI for code problems, um, business subject matter experts, why would they need us to solve AI for code? Because they, they are not techies, right? They wouldn't want to go through pages and pages or lines and lines and notebooks and notebooks of code. They'd say, here is the code. Can you please summarize it for me in natural language? Wonderful. Can we do that? I think we should be able to do that in a couple of years. Developers, which is more like you and me, you know, we, we want to write code. Uh, we know what the business requirement is, but maybe someone somewhere out there must have written some code in Git. I want to search. I want to give a natural language query and search for those code, um, code snippets. Can I do that? I should be able to do that in a couple of years. Similar for testing, right? There's enough use cases to say, can I do automated generation of new test cases? As applications evolve, can I re-update and regenerate my test cases so that the new conditions are checked? And all of this is not with people, but with technology assist um, with technology assisting people. All right. I, lo I, love, I love this, uh, you know, cycle uh, and as you guys, you know, grow, you know, go beyond universities, do your first job, a lot of this will be rolled up in your training, right? There's whole software development life cycle, SDLC as we call it, which starts with planning, requirement gathering, designing and prototyping, iterating, going back to requirements, designing again building the code, testing the code, maybe in a couple of years, uh, modernize the code, and then deploy that package on cloud, and then manage and make sure that the code is up in 99.999% available. That's, that's, that's the life cycle. And there are many, many interesting problems, right? We talked about you know, using AI for code search, code generation, that's, that's really our mantra. The red boxes are the first use case that you've seen, which is, you know, uh, how the microservices um, advisor, containerization advisor. 
And then I'll show you one more interesting problem, which is when the code is developed and the application is hosted in the cloud, there is a team of sysadmins, um, Google calls them site reliability engineers. So if the site reliability engineers are, think of them as more modern DevOps practices aware uh, sysadmins, uh, really helping them with the AI tools, right? That's my next example. But there can be plenty, right? I mean, imagine the, there's the whole world of opportunities in code build, in requirement gathering, maybe getting from natural language to code. And, and the opportunities are limitless. So this is the phase. So we talked about modernization, which was one phase. This is the ops and the management phase. And um, again, it's a very human intensive uh, operation. Today, the cloud providers have thousands and thousands of site rel reliability engineers really watching their applications as they function on the cloud, looking for all kinds of metrics, uh, events, um, logs, KPIs, downtime, tickets, you know, deployment artifacts to figure out if there is an early signal, right? And why is it so important to get early signal? Because yes, you can always be in this reactive mode, but the holy grail is have an application up and running with zero time downtime, right? When I go to pay my Airtel bills, I don't really want to know, get that message at oops, there's something wrong with your server, please come back and pay again. I'm probably going to not pay, right? Which reduce, which results in millions and millions of income loss for my service provider. So it's very important to get to more predictive and proactive journeys. Um, but the reality is that uh, one of the complications of this monolith to microservice world is that we've now changed the scale from one application to 50X. And then I said multi-cloud. So they are, these are deployed in all different data centers all around the world with all other SRE teams working on it. So basically ops management is not going to be possible in this new world with no AI. So there's no ops without AI. And that's a claim that I would make because the data sources are too huge. There are too many signals out there to really figure out what's noise and what's the signal. So I'm, I'm actually going to focus on one proactive method, which is, you know, um, the fault has not yet happened, but can I give an early signal in, in my um, operational workflow? And this also relates to code. And I'm trying to build the whole theme around code. The many, all of these are huge time series, log anomaly detection, incident resolution problems. And, lots and lots of papers around it. But I'm going to focus on this one proactive bit. So what's the process and what happens? What does the deaf persona do? A typical day, okay? Uh, PR is a pull request. So a dev is creating a feature. I wanna create this neat feature um, in my application. I write code, I commit. I do some unit integration test, success if it fails. I don't merge the PR, um, I iterate till there's a success, right? And there's rework and this continues. At the point that it passes, I put it for build, right? It's building many other files and it takes my little file with that little change and it says to the build su succeed or fail. Well, it fails. Again, I, I can't move forward. But if it passes, if the build passes, today what will happen is there will be a merge and there will be a deployment. Now we as developers know that just because the build passes means very little, has very little correlation as to whether there will be a downstream incident. And this is where AI can help, right? Because we're doing this every day, you know, the DevOps savvy organization do multiple builds a day. Some do it once a week, uh, but most, most of them are on agile DevOps processes. So uh, what, 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 what is happening here? I mean, I just wanted to put out a picture for more complexity. There's 
let's say there's three developers, each one of them putting PRs, each PR can have multiple files touched, they all go into a master PR, and then there's a deployment. And it's a complex process, right? It's a complex process. What is the problem statement that we can solve? After the build has succeeded, for a pull request, can I access all the historical data, including you know, previous build failures, previous commits, previous incident outages, and give a prediction of whether this pull request is risky or not, right? So it's much earlier in the cycle. It's after the dev, the developer persona has done all its checks. I give a risk score, right? And, and then um, let me just go through the animation that says, and, and there are many, many ways this risk score can be calculated. I will show you, I will show you one way of calculating. I mean, this is, a very interesting Git artifact, right? There's a developer who's given a description in natural language and, and there's been a reviewer who said, you know, uh, okay, this has um, one commit and three files changed and I'm going to go through, the human is going through making sure line by line, all the commits look good. Instead, we could throw an AI algorithm at it, look at its similarity with past usages and give a risk score. And overall, this is, this is the hierarchy in which the risk score could come up. We could have file level risks, file level risks are up to commit level risk, and then these get into the PR risk. And I'm going to a little bit fast forward. Uh, a good animation. Yellow dots, all commits. We are all committing, we're checking in code. The two commits, that gives the hint that this is, I'm fixing a bug, right? Because either, because Git produces a label or it got assigned to me. Now there are very smart ways of figuring out if I'm fixing a bug, a bug has been introduced before it, right? So we go back, we do a little bit of walk in the history to find out what files could have caused the bug. And this, this creates our, self-supervised learning because you know training machine learning al algorithms with label data is very difficult. So we find out the bug fixing commits, we go back in history and find the files which really cause the bugs. And then you start creating your linkages and your label data. So if you're able to do that, then in future, you, you take all the PRs, you break it up into feature instruction. What's the description of the PR? How many people worked on it? What were the lines of code? What were the files changed? Build all of that into a risk assessment score. And then at the time of your Git commit, when the build succeeds, you show a risk, right? And, and this is, this we've, we've talked to so many DevOps person and they say, if you can do it, then this is going to be really, really useful for us. So I'll stop there. I'll stop there because I want to keep it open for a few questions. Um, but just recapping, right? I, I, I think if there's any message that you want to take away from today's talk, it's that the world is changing. It's changing in directions that, um, that are all very, very strongly focused on AI and cloud. And these two trends continue. So as we decide what we want to do next, there's a very, very interesting set of problems which are at the junction of using AI to accelerate the modernization to the cloud. And that works with a new data source that I'm presenting and it's called code, right? In general, in my definition, you know, I, I know I showed both Java code as well as showing um, Git commits. So, so both are code code but code could also mean configuration files. It could also mean YAMLs. It could also mean uh, file descriptors. There's this whole new field of code emerging. And if you look back at what we've done with speech, with image, with uh, text, there's a need to do similar things like release huge data sets, start challenges, work on interesting problems like summarization, search, generation. 
and the whole world is there for you um, to Hello. create a community on solving AI for huh. So with that, a little about IBM Research, um, where I come from. IBM Research is spread. I don't know. I'll check. 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 I um in india we are in delhi bangalore and um under the india umbrella also comes the singapore lab and these are you know our our areas of interest and two very very important things that we treasure uh, are our university relationships and our partnerships with uh, associations like acm as well as of course our business units right so all these problems that i talk to you about is in conjunction with our business unit partners so with that i'll stop sharing and i'll be ready for any questions thank you gargi that was indeed a very interesting talk so i request the audience to post your questions on the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, if uh, any of the hosts and panelists, you have any questions to Gargi, maybe you can uh, start. Well, I uh, can't see the questions as such uh, coming over here. Uh, so uh, I have a question, uh, Gargi, that, uh, you know, uh, very interesting opportunities for uh, building code in future that you were mentioning. Now, particularly interesting are these, uh, you know, building these applications for summarizing the code and also doing a risk assessment based on past data etc so uh, the the point uh, i mean what seems really mind boggling over here is that how would we go about assessing the uh, correctness of these uh, codes themselves this risk analysis and all that so that also seems to be quite a daunting task to build reliable systems for doing these aspects. So what's your comment on that? Yeah, no, uh, that's that's very true, Lipika. I mean, because all of these generate in human intensive processes, right? Usually modernization was a human intensive processes and no one really thought of creating label data so that one could downstream, you know, in a few years from today, really run machine learning algorithms and assess how accurate these are. So that continues to remain a problem, I would say. So the two, two, two ways to think of what are the classes of problems. One is, how do you know, how do you use labeled, you know, supervised learning algorithms in these domain? And if you, if you see all the approaches are either you know, self-supervised learning or unsupervised that I talked about clustering, encoder, decoder. So, so that continues to remain a challenge. I don't think, um, even though they're, they're making small, small uh, steps, uh, I'll, I'll forward, there is a link called CodeNet. It's, it's almost like the image net for code that we're starting to curate so that the researchers of tomorrow don't land up into the same issues that we had when we started a couple of years back. So that's that's one journey, but that CodeNet handles a certain set of use cases like summarization, search, um, generation. But of course, there are uh, like like the risk prediction work. Like, how do you know you've done a good job, or the microservices prediction work? And there, I think right now we are just working with SMEs, right? Subject matter experts who look at it and tell us, yes, this is in the right direction, or this is not. 
I, I don't think we have that much label data to really answer that question that how good are we doing and how, how do we know we are doing well and when we improve. And it, it, I think it's going to emerge with time. I think as the community builds up and does more experiments with CodeNet, maybe they contribute back uh, their label data sets and you know, helps us really recognize some of these tasks. But beyond SME knowledge, I don't have a good answer for understanding how well your risk prediction models are doing. But what we've done, and I know that even conversational learning systems went the same way, right? We've put in feedback and human in the loop features where everything, with every recommendation, there's a way to say, I don't think this is correct, or please relook at the recommendation and then put in active learning frameworks. And that's probably, and we're just collecting data. You know, the system is out there for a year. I, I think hopefully in a few months, we should be able to use the human in the low feedback to improve the systems. But, um, but those are the two things that I see feasible now, right? Uh, small groups of domain knowledge and SME validation, and then putting in your features, no matter how small it is. Right, always put the option for getting some human in the loop feedback. Yeah, thanks. I, I mean, I strongly believe this human in the loop is a way to go forward, not only for this, but for many applications. And that has to be popularized uh, even for AI application acceptance. So there is one question here from Shilpa. Uh, on the risk assessment use mm -hmm. case you showed, what is the action of the DevOps team uh, or what are the actions that the DevOps team can take based on knowing the risk prone comments? Yeah. It's an excellent question actually. And so um, I'll tell you, so, so the action that they can take, so think of it as gates, right? Um, and even though the build passed, the risk was high. This is now left up to the human judgment that do you actually merge that change and let it go into downstream production or do you hold on to that change? So they can at that point decide if they're going to be willing to override that risk recommendation on go forward. But, but Chilpa, I think in your question, it comes back to what Lipika was asking. This explicit action that the team, like whether it's the team lead or the, you know, or the management takes on overriding the risk recommendation creates a label data entry for us. One, we can go back, you know, if there is a downstream incident, we can go back and look at all risk recommendations, which was risky and then flag it. So it helps in finding needle in the haystack much further because something has now gone down. The application is not responding. Let me go back and see in the last two days if I actually had a high risk recommendation or nothing happened. And that's the feedback to the algorithm that maybe there was a feature that we are over tuning for and this feature is not important if we keep getting risk recommendations and overriding it. But, but that action is very important because if you're able to record that action that creates our data. And, but, but that's the action, it's, think of it as a gate and they can stop the merge or, uh, and go back and have the developers look at it, or they can go ahead with it. So since uh, uh, there are no other questions, uh, I think uh, I can just thank you, Gargi. That was a really interesting and very exciting talk. It is really very helpful for all of uh, all the people who heard you today. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, Thank you. Bye. My pleasure. Like I said, ACMW has a long history in my, I mean, I remember when I was younger in my career, I would love to attend its key talk, keynotes and my pleasure to be here. And thank you, Lipika. Thank you. Uh, we owe very big thanks. We owe very big thanks to Dr. Gargi Das Gupta for this insightful talk on artificial intelligence and its application on cloud. I'm sure that most of us are intrigued by this talk and we hope this will help us on our future research. And also thank you, Dr. Lipika Day for being the chair for this talk.